In this video, I'd like to talk about the pre-Socratic philosophers. I have some notes and, uh, that I'd like to expand on a little bit and share with you. This is a follow-up to uh, the, the last video that we did, where we just sort of explored what philosophy is. What is philosophy? And in that last video, we uh, proposed a, a couple of different uh, general definitions that try and characterize the activity of philosophy. Uh, at the close of that presentation, we did raise the distinction between philosophy as uh, a tradition, which we can say starts with the pre-Socratics and extends through to today, uh, that that's one sense of philosophy. From another point of view, you can say philosophy is uh, an activity uh, that we can engage in as human beings with one another or even just by ourselves, a kind of questioning of, uh, of things, questioning of what's true. So in the, the, Considering the beginnings, and this is this video is an exploration of one the tr beginnings of the tradition. And you could ask, uh, well, why did philosophy begin at this particular time in history? And just like you could ask, how did philosophy get started for a particular individual? I'm saying, you know, true philosophy, anyhow, you know, truly thinking and questioning uh, what's true. What leads up to that? Or what, what set of circumstances or life experiences makes it, uh, makes it possible? So there's probably a parallel between the beginnings, the pre-Socratics and the beginnings for, for us as individuals. Primarily, we're going to, in this case, we're, we're just going to look at how it got started for the pre-Socratics. It's a pretty interesting story and a pretty interesting group of individuals. Uh, here's a, a map of the ancient world uh, around the time uh, when the pre-Socratics appeared. And uh, it's we're looking at the, the Mediterranean in the, the center is uh, this is the northern coast of the Mediterranean. In the center is Greece. On the, our left is Italy. On the right is what we would call modern day Turkey. So in the around the, the 6th and 5th century BCE, is when uh, these philosophers that we're going to take a look at when they when they appeared, and they seem to have a uh, a different kind of interest than people had had previously. Well, that's an interesting question: why philosophy should begin at this particular time in history? It's uh, if we think that before this period uh, philosophy didn't exist, so something has to happen which uh, facilitates this beginning. And I'm not sure we can answer that entirely, but uh, there are a few things we could say about life in ancient Greece at this time. Uh, f first of all, we can point out that uh, at this point in history, the Greeks were doing pretty well. They were prosperous. They made their living on the sea. And prosperity or the accumulation of wealth, you might say, is a kind of precondition for people having time, I mean, to, to sit down and think about things. And if uh, you spend all your time trying to meet your basic needs, it doesn't seem like you would have much time to do philosophy. So the, the Greeks were prosperous and that's, that helped. Secondly, 
their occupation on on the sea they engaged in trade with other cities around the, the Mediterranean uh, exposed them to the different cultures different ideas and values that other peoples had and this exposure to differences also s seems to be necessary in order to to start asking questions about well, who's got the best uh, ideas or who's got the right values to have if uh, we live in a monolithic society where everybody thinks the same thing it's a little harder to imagine people starting to ask questions about it so it's only when we're exposed to different points of view that uh, these questions start to appear uh, the last point I have listed here is that uh, probably the, the most important is that at this time period, uh, you, you could say that people have always had these questions about life and, uh, and the world that they live in and so forth. But at this time period, there was some dissatisfaction with the kinds of answers that people were getting some disappointment in what the traditional answers to the basic questions about the world were. And we could say that those traditional answers came from uh, either mythology or religion. You could say uh, for the Greeks had a, an elaborate mythology and they also had uh, religious beliefs that were kind of derived from their mythologies. And those mythologies, you could say, where, what was the origin of the myths? And we say they, they came from the poets, like in the Greek case from Homer, and we arguably from the human imagination. So at this point in history, some of the Greeks were no longer satisfied with those kinds of explanations. I mean, uh, they wanted something more. So this turn to the, the world itself in order to explain the world led to the proposal of theories about what things were and uh, how, they, how they behaved. And uh, so different thinkers would propose theories, but it wasn't uh, accepted that just because you proposed a theory, people should accept it. So there had to be explanations, or you had to justify your theory, or you had to argue for it. And then you could say that the, the person who had the, the best explanations for why things were the, the way that they were, or had the best arguments, was the one who, uh, that you should listen to more. The, these first philosophers, the pre-Socratics, that we're going to take a look at, I mean, you wouldn't say that they were interested in the, the complete range of philosophical questions. They had a, a certain number of interests that they pursued and, a couple, and certain types of questions that they tended to ask. Primarily, they were interested in the world of nature, trying to explain the natural world. Nature in Greek was physis, or I think more properly physis, you would say, and that's clearly the root for what we call physics today. So the, the first philosophers were really doing something like natural philosophy, the philosophy of nature. And you can see right away that this beginning of philosophy is also the beginning of a scientific way of trying to understand the world as well. So in the beginning, philosophy and science are kind of uh, the same thing. Uh, so some of the, the basic questions that a lot of the philosophers were interested in is what's the basic stuff? out of which everything 
is made. I mean, so what is, what's the basis of everything that we experience? It's kind of like asking about elements, but that term isn't quite uh, used yet, you know, so it's like, what's everything made out of? And so that's one thing. And the other question was, how do you account for change? The fact that everything always seems to be changing. If you want to give an explanation for what people experience about reality, you could say, how, how do you explain the fact that things come into existence and then go out of existence? Or things become alive and then they... Uh, they eventually, they sort of, they die. You know, how do you explain generation and decay? So these were some of the fundamental questions that the philosophers kind of gravitated towards, the first philosophers, anyhow. So for these new kinds of uh, answers, or uh, people began to turn away from uh, just what had always been traditionally accepted or what it seemed like uh, came from the imagination. People turned away from that towards another way of trying to explain the world. You'd say that was they, they, they looked at the world in terms of what they could actually have experiences of. What direct observation of reality told them, combined with uh, thinking about what those observations were. So you get direct observations and reasoning about things. And these two basic approaches uh, give philosophy two different ways of thinking about the world that will develop and become pretty distinct as time goes, time goes on. The first one we're just going to call empiricism. You could have an empirical approach to the world in which there's more emphasis is given to actually having experiences or having seen things for yourself, observations. And so uh, reliance, primary reliance on experience and observation gives you an empirical approach. The, the other approach is gives more emphasis to the thoughts that are needed to think about what we experience. So you say that's rationalism. And here the, the emphasis is more on the rules of thought, rational principles, logical thinking. Uh, and stuff like that. So you get two distinct kinds of philosophy gradually begin to appear. The philosopher who is usually given credit for being the, the first philosopher or the father of philosophy, so to speak, is Thales. And uh, he was lived in uh, Miletus, which was on the the uh, eastern shores of the Aegean, which would be in modern day Turkey. Uh, and he sort of had a theory that the, the basic substance out of which everything else could be derived was water. So you say that kind of position is monism, to, to feel that there's only one basic substance and everything else is somehow derived from that substance. That's, uh, we call that monist theory. So Thales had his argument and uh, he could argue that water is capable of, you know, existing in different states. It could become steam or it can become ice, so it could be a, a exist in different physical states. And he would have his uh, arguments uh, to try and explain everything. I mean, we don't have so much information about what his theories actually were. But, you know, we, we shouldn't be so quick to think that he was simple-minded because he apparently was capable of, of 
predicting uh, eclipses and sort of determining when was a good time to to buy into the, the the wine press industry so he made a lot of money by being able to see how things were going to go but anyhow i mean and he, as it happens in philosophy i mean he had he had some followers who were interested in his ideas two of them in particular first one was uh, anaximander and is typical in philosophy that the students don't necessarily just accept what the teacher has to say, but they question it and, uh, and want to try and improve it. And so Anaximander did that I mean, to his teacher's theories. Anaximander proposed that the basic substance out of which everything else is supposed to come has to be something which is indeterminate in itself and boundless in its uh, in its limitations so he calls this the apiron so which is something which is indeterminate and boundless i'm going to say that the basic substance has to be something that could become anything and there has to be uh, an unlimited quantity of it so that was an examander thinking about what if you want to look for a source material and say that everything comes from that, that it would have to be something with these kinds of characteristics. The second pupil of Thales was Anaximenes. And you can see that Anaximenes tries to come up with a compromise position between Thales and Anaximander. So you can say that uh, Anaximander's Aperion it seems too ethereal to be the the basis of everything, and and Thales' water is is too definite. So Anaximenes wants to propose something in between, something which is too ethereal and something which is too concrete. So he proposes air as the basis uh, element out of which everything else is somehow derived. You see all three of them are monist philosophers. They all want to argue a case for a single element which is primary and everything is derived from it. As a group these philosophers were known as the Milesians and we're not uh, all that interested in what their specific arguments were. Uh, we're more interested in what they were trying to do and sort of uh, and how they were trying to go about it than in than in the the actual content of their thought they were trying to give their own explanations they gave arguments for their positions and they they criticized each other as they went forward trying to get what they thought was the best explanation uh, the second of the pre-Socratic philosophers we wanted to look a little more closely at is Pythagoras and his theories are certainly a bit more interesting than those of the Milesian philosophers. Pythagoras is uh, kind of well known to us I mean so the, the Pythagorean theorem is uh, Theorem relating to right angle triangles, x squared plus y squared equals z squared, is known in, in geometry to, to most people. So, but Pythagoras had uh, believed that mathematics was the key to everything. So, for him, the, the basic element, elements out of which everything else was derived, were numbers. And uh, how he thought of numbers is a bit of a question. I mean, uh, whether he was talking about numbers or numerical relationships as a, a way to to think about reality is a little unclear. But the study of numbers, mathematics, geometry, and so forth, were very much emphasized in his his way of trying to understand reality. Numbers were the basic substances. 
out of which everything is composed. And for him, numbers weren't abstractions. They were actually existing things, not something that just exists in the mind. And Pythagoras had uh, a lot of followers, and uh, people refer to as Pythagoreans. And they developed uh, communities uh, that they, they lived in, sort of separate from other people. And they had a, a, a program of study for the people who lived in these, uh, in these communities. And uh, three subjects I've identified were central. The first was the study of mathematics and geometry. So again, a kind of primary studies, study of numbers and their interrelationships between numbers. We say one number in a relationship to a, another number is a ratio. And you should remind ourselves that ratio, uh, ratio, is the, the, the root word for our word rational. So there's still this sense that uh, rational order has something that is based on uh, kind of relationships like this. So there's a lot of interest in ratios and proportions in the study of mathematics and geometry. Geometry in particular was looked at as the, the divine discipline, more, you know, privileged over all other studies. And it was, if you thought that reality was numerical and that there was a divinity in reality, then the study of numbers was a way of understanding the divinity were becoming closer to God. Music was another area where mathematics was uh, involved and studied. Uh, the Pythagoreans developed uh, musical scales and uh, harmonics. And some of the, their neighbors referred to them as string pluckers because they were always experimenting with uh, the sounds that you could get from stretching strings and, and getting different notes and so forth from them. Uh, even this idea that there was a kind of rational order in music and involving just like music could be looked at mathematically meant that there was a relationship between music and sort of everything else. And the Pythagoreans had this notion of the music of the spheres, and that even the the whole of reality was a kind of had a kind of musicality to it, and or that there was the 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 harmony of the spheres, the harmony of the world was musical as well as it was geometrical and mathematical. So when you're understanding sort of the, the world that we live in and you feel it's not chaotic but in accordance with certain laws and principles, Pythagorean stuff, that was the study of numbers and music combined. They also studied medicine and uh, uh, more so health, you know, the health of the human organism, the human being, and the idea that health was a kind of established balance and proportion within the body, and again, which was a, a balance and a proportion that could be mathematically expressed. Disease or illness were conceived as disturbances of this internal balance, so you would try to correct things, put things back in their proper order. So they were interested in the health of the body. They were also interested in the health of the soul. And maybe the aim of the, the program of study in these Pythagorean communities was the purification of the soul. That this understanding of mathematics, geometry, music, and medicine 
was all a kind of a way of purifying the soul and uh, allowing for it uh, to see things more clearly. I don't know what would happen in the, if one achieved the ultimate in this case. They did believe in reincarnation and not endless reincarnation, but that a particular soul could go through a number of lifetimes of a human being. But at a certain point when a person would die, how the soul would die too. So this is a more interesting teaching. It has a long, influential history as well. Uh, but we'll try and see how that gets picked up later. Heraclitus is the third pre-Socratic philosopher we'd like to comment on. Like Pythagoras, his ideas, his thinking is uh, interesting. And he has an influence that reaches far beyond the time of the pre-Socratic philosophers. You can say that uh, later his uh, ideas show up with Stoic philosophers, uh, more closer to the even the modern era. You can find the thinkers like Nietzsche, uh, Hegel, and Heidegger all have all write about uh, Heraclitus in a positive vein, where there's something they see in his philosophy that they still think is interesting to consider. It's a little peculiar because the information that we have about Heraclitus, like most of the pre-Socratic philosophers, is pretty thin. I mean, not a lot of uh, direct source material to rely on. In the case of Heraclitus, there are, there's a collection of basically sayings uh, or kind of short, kind of almost cryptic statements about things that uh, are all that remains of what he had to say. And although I think Nietzsche, who was a pretty good classical scholar, sort of argued that uh, there was a more extensive collection of uh, writings from Heraclitus, but this is all that that's remains for us. And I think if, uh, if we look at it, I think there's almost a hundred sayings, but nowhere is it sort of developed into a coherent presentation of what his thought was. So you kind of have to interpret uh, his statements and uh, in spite of the difficulty, there, the tradition seems to indicate that there's a, a kind of consensus as to what the, the general drift of his philosophy was. One of the statements that he, he gives us is one that's pretty well known. Uh, you cannot step in the same river twice. Now, how are we supposed to understand? What's the the meaning for that? Again, it's not explained, uh, but clearly it looks like he's emphasizing. Well, you get you know you ask why can't you step in the same river twice, and because uh, the water is always flowing, and at, wherever you step in the river, the what the water that you're stepping into is water that wasn't there previously. So you could say the river, the nature of the river is always changing. And so you, we can't take what he has to say literally. You kind of have to understand sayings like this metaphorically. And he seems to be emphasizing that nature is always changing. And, or he makes statements that all is in flux. Uh, we want to say that we want to 
keep in mind that he all he also emphasizes that there is something which underlies all the change which doesn't change i will explain as we go along so you can't step in the same river twice we take it metaphorically and he's talking about reality in some sense reality is like a river you could say even within ourselves in human reality that within our own consciousness we say we say there's a stream of consciousness or a flow of thoughts which is almost non-stop and in a sense if you look inside yourself you can never step in the same river twice because your thought processes are always developing always changing but then again, at the same time, you can say that there's still always your thoughts, you know. And so there's something unitary beneath, in the midst of all the change or behind all the change. Just like in the river, the water is always flowing, but still it's the same river. So it's kind of a, a it's like a paradox. There's a, change and that which doesn't change together and that reality reality is like this that there's an aspect of reality that's constantly changing but nevertheless uh, there's also some kind of underlying uh, something which stays the same yeah heraclitus like uh, his predecessors is looking you know, identifies an element that he thinks is the best one to to use to talk about reality. And for him, it's fire as the basic element. And again, the only way to understand this is metaphorically. And it's, uh, if you look at it, I mean, it, it, metaphorically, it's, it's kind of a rich line of thought. So you could say fire, Kind of in his view best represents the changing nature of reality so everything that exists is constantly being transformed excuse me <clears throat> if you think about a piece of wood that burns uh, while it's burning it there's flame, there's heat, there's smoke, and in the end, there's uh, ashes. So you would say, it's not like the, the wood has entirely been destroyed, but what it has been is it's been transformed into these, these other things, the, the heat, the flame, the smoke, and the ash, and so forth. And there's... You say so it's become something different than what it was and you could say that reality that's what's happening in reality that reality is constantly being transformed that there's change taking place in reality all the time and not like reality things in reality are destroyed but they just take new forms so it's kind of just like an equal measure of what goes in and what comes out. It's kind of like conservation of energy. So you got that. And then Heraclitus also uses this term, logos, Greek term, uh, to indicate that which is always the same in the midst of all the change and uh, like in Pythagoras I think logos refers to a kind of order that exists beneath the ongoing change a kind of and I think we could say it's a kind of rational order uh, 
so you can say you can't step in the same river twice. Everything is always flowing. But, you know, there, there's sort of a structure or an underlying aspect to things, which is the kind of laws that are in place that govern how things change. And logos is a way of referring to that. I think it's, you know, it's interesting. There's a fire in a way. You could say that there's this logos in that there's fire also represents uh, a spark of, you could say there's a spark of the fire. There's a spark of the order that exists in in nature within ourselves, a kind of spark of life, you know, a spark of reason. Uh, and ultimately, you know, later, I don't think Heraclitus says this, but a uh, subsequent thinker as well, that there's a spark of the divine uh, in each of us that enables us to, to understand, to live and to understand. Well, the, the fourth specific philosopher we want to comment on amongst pre-Socratics is Par Parmenides. And Parmenides in particular in, invites uh, contrast with uh, the philosophy of Heraclitus. And uh, we'll make use of that in our next slide a little bit. But Heraclitus argued that everything is reality is constantly changing and Parmenides is going to argue just the opposite he's going to say that the, nothing which is real changes so then that the reality of change or that uh, what appears to be change is just a, an illusion on his view <clears throat> so it, you know Parmenides argues a point of view that is kind of uh, uh, hard to acknowledge like where it comes from and how how is that possible to deny the existence of change when it, if we just look around it looks to us like everything's always changing but if we look at uh Heraclite, i'm sorry parmenides we see that he he argues on the basis of certain what we call a priori principles principles of reason and in this regard, he's he's going to be an example of rationalism, somebody who gives more significance to what the mind tells us about reality and what our senses tell us about reality. <clears throat> Two arguments in particular that Parmenides makes is, <coughs> excuse me, is that a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time in the same respect. Uh, something either is or it is not, and there's no in-between state uh, between those two. So you'd say that's the principle of non-contradiction. Both A thing can't both be and not be at the same time. That seems obvious. Okay, that's true. You say that's a kind of a priori principle. The second thing he argues is that it's impossible for something to come from nothing. So again, if you don't have anything to start with, there's no way that you can get anything from it. So that's another principle um, kind of a priori logical principle <clears throat> that uh, Parmenides wants to focus on. A principle that kind of the mind tells us that, you know, that if you don't have something to start with, you can't get anything from it. Now that's an interesting argument, and for the Greeks, that was a principle that was really pretty much uh, adhered to. You know, and this sort of, if you extend it a little bit, you can see that that means, as it does for Parmenides, that whatever 
exist has to always have existed and that there could never have been a time when there was nothing because if ever there was a time when there was nothing then there would still be nothing i mean there because there'd be no way to get something that came out of nothing <coughs> the one religious uh, argument that uh, the the greeks would have had a hard time with is the one in Christianity, where uh, Augustine says that God created uh, everything out of nothing, you know, so that this Christian doctrine that there was nothing, and then God brought reality into existence. That would have been an idea that was difficult for the, the Greeks to accept, because for them, there always there had to be something which always existed. So the conclusions that Parmenides will, will draw from these kinds of arguments, if a thing has to either be or not be, and, uh, uh, and it's impossible to, to get something from nothing, then he's going to conclude that whatever is has to always have been. And change technically is impossible because when something changes, it goes from being one thing to being something else and uh in that uh, in accordance with his principle is not something that could happen it's like going from something which uh, is not to something which is or back and back and forth so for him being is uh something which is unitary changeless eternal and one it's not quite what we would think of as as God, you know, but uh, maybe in in some in some sense there's uh, something to be said for that. This is a you know a difficult intellectual position, and uh, logically it's hard to argue with what he had to say, but it also seems to contradict what our ordinary experience of reality is. Uh, as I said before, we can use the philosophies of Heraclitus and then of Parmenides uh, as illustrations of the difference between empiricism and rationalism. Uh, um, you know, it, maybe it's a misuse of Heraclitus because in a sense for him there are, there are some things that don't change, but uh, in general, the the central uh, principle in Heraclitus is everything is always changing, and uh, our sense experience kind of verifies that just uh, uh, without uh, any kind of question. So that's kind of obvious. And so he's an empiricist, or his his position seems to be empirical. Parmenides, on the other hand is clearly a good example of a, a rationalist or somebody who doesn't trust what the senses tell them about reality, but would rather trust his thoughts, uh, the principles of thoughts in a way. So that's typical of rationalist is that they give precedence to the what the mind tells them is real, more so than what the, the body tells them is real. So we'll set that aside. Uh, one other philosopher I just want to comment on. Uh, you know, maybe it's a little simplistic, but you can see Empedocles wants to try to uh, synthesize the positions of Heraclitus and Parmenides. You know, you have these two opposing positions: one which emphasizes change, the other emphasizes a sense in which everything's the same. So Empedocles is trying to find a way to, to have both of these be true. And he does this by arguing that there are basic elements. And for him, he just identifies four of them, earth, air, fire, and water. And you could say these elements uh, are constants. The elements themselves don't change. 
but they can enter into different combinations and give us different kinds of things. So the elements themselves are, don't change. So that kind of is kind of like uh, uh, Parmenides. On the other hand, he also argues that there are two forces that work on these basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And these forces that uh, are what sort of account for the changes that we actually experience. He says one force has to be something like love, which unites things, brings them together, accounts for creation and growth. And then a, a contrary force which separates things and accounts for decay and death. So you have, uh, so now we're talking about basic elements and sort of uh, basic forces in nature. So that seems to be a kind of advance. It still seems a, a little simplistic, but uh, the ideas are another step in trying to explain what stays the same and what changes in our experience of reality. Okay, our last slide in this presentation, uh, which has proved to be longer than anticipated. And here on this last page, again, there's another contrast, uh, which is, you know, philosophically interesting, I think. So, um, we're going to give more time to the the second group of thinkers, the atomist and Anaxagoras. But Anaxagoras was, uh, we're not giving him a lot of time, but uh, was a significant contributor to among the pre-Socratic philosophers as well. So we're just looking at his kind of main idea. And in, Anaxagoras introduced the idea of nous. Greek term, which was a way of referring to uh, maybe like universal mind or a kind of rational governing principle in nature. And that there, for Anaxagoras, there had to be something like uh, an intelligence that made everything be the way that it is and for him the intelligence had to be something other than material so something like a universal mind that sort of was responsible for the order that we observe in nature so mind is different from matter and in his view mind is what first sets matter in motion. So for him, you couldn't have a strictly materialistic explanation of the world of human experience, that a material explanation couldn't account for it all. So we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, now in Contradistinction to this, the atomist, the most prominent of which was Democritus, argued a case to the contrary, and that's a, a case for materialism. Uh, how they came up with this theory, the atomist, I mean, is uh, is kind of left open, you know. So how could they? I mean, this is the world, the, a time before there's any kind of so, you know, microscope, microscope and so forth to see what's going on in kind of the invisible aspect of things. But uh, the atomist argued that tiny invisible or invisible to the naked eye, anyhow, atoms are the basic stuff out of which everything else is composed. So atoms were tiny uh, particles indestructible in themselves and but were the basis of everything that uh, that we know to be in existence these atoms uh, according to the theory uh, moved 
randomly sort of through space. I mean, they, they, they kind of fell or falling in a way, but not like other things fall. You know, maybe they, they floated in space. And they were governed by a kind of uh, random, or there's no, doesn't seem to be anything in particular, no order in terms of how they, they fall. Uh, these atoms were supposedly uh, different, differently shaped. And because they were differently shaped, they were capable of combining with one another. Uh, they would occasionally bump into each other, and they might become connected uh, as a result of this bumping in, or else they might just bounce off. But uh, uh, and this was these atoms were supposedly separated from each other by a kind of void spaces so they just kind of floated around and in some extent fell. Uh, the the term used for their motion was Kleinemann. So according to the the atomist everything that exists was the result of these kinds of uh, actions, these kinds of random movements and combinations and so forth. So there was no sense that there was a, a purpose or a design involved in, in how things happen. It doesn't mean that everything was accidental. I mean, because there were rules or laws that governed when things would get connected and so forth. But it was kind of denied that there was any kind of plan in how things uh, evolved as a result of this kind of process. And really, you know, how they came to this is uh, not entirely clear, but it certainly looks like a precursor to modern sort of evolutionary type theories. And especially a theory in which there was uh, no attempt to justify things in terms of a divinity or a god or uh, an intelligence that sort of guided how things happen. So you have this uh, uh, contrast with the arguments of Anaxagoras and the arguments of the atomist, one of which insists that there has to be a kind of intelligence in the design of everything, and the other which says that the, there is no universal mind. Now, if you're an, an, an atomist, you know, and a strict materialist, you still, there's uh, consequences that go with that kind of theory. I mean, and, uh, that sort of uh, are challenging sort of to deal with. But nonetheless, that's, uh, that's what it is. I'll just say in conclusion to this longer than expected presentation that there's no definite right or wrong in any of these theories and you could say that they certainly didn't agree with each other and there was a lot of different points of view exposed, ex explored and it looks like that's just what it is uh, amongst the pre-Socratics it was a an exploration of the possibilities in terms of how can we explain I mean the, the reality that that we know and live in, and these are just some of the possibilities.